Hello, everyone. Thanks to everyone who's joined us for our Closing the Treatment Gap in Communities of Color, the Role of Providers in Medication-Assisted Treatment for Opioid Use Disorder Patients webinar this afternoon. My name is Juliette Bui with the HHS Office of Minority Health, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Um, so before we begin, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, this webinar is being recorded. And you'll receive an email after the webinar, which includes a link to watch the recording. All participants will be automatically muted throughout the duration of this webinar. But we will have time for questions after our last presentation. So please feel free to submit your questions at any point during the webinar via the chat box on the right side of your screen. And we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. On the right side of your screen, you'll also see a handouts box. Uh, where uh, you can download the slides, and you can also request the slides via email by emailing info at minorityhealth.hhs.gov. Can I have the next slide, please? So these will be uh, a number of disclaimer slides for our webinar. Next slide. So for this particular webinar, Certified Health Education Specialist, or CHES credits, and one and a half continuing medical education, or CME credits through Meharry Medical College are available. And instructions on how to apply for those credits will be emailed following the webinar. And again, you can download uh, the CME evaluation form in the handout box as well. Next slide. Thank you. And the next slide. Great. So today we're excited to have presentations from experts focused on the opioid use disorder and treatment. Welcome and thank you to Dr. Chinazo Cunningham, Dr. Tiffany Liu, Dr. Edwin Chapman, and Ms. Wanda Brown for joining us today. Next slide, please. And before we begin our expert presentations, I want to provide some additional context for this webinar, which is part of a series through which we at OMH want to elevate a call to action for providers to address opioid-related disparities experienced by racial and ethnic minority populations. Our first webinar focused on a call to action for providers to engage in prevention activities. Through today's webinar, we ask providers to help break down barriers to treatment. And in our upcoming final webinar, we ask providers to ensure services are culturally and linguistically competent. And we hope you will feel empowered to respond to this call to action. Our first speakers, Dr. Chinazo Cunningham and Dr. Tiffany Liu, will be laying the groundwork for today's webinar with a presentation on racial and ethnic differences seen in the opioid epidemic, options for medication-assisted treatment, particularly buprenorphine, and naloxone utilization. Dr. Cunningham has spent 20 years providing care, developing programs, and conducting research. Her research centers on drug addiction and treatment, particularly opioid addiction and the use of buprenorphine for treatment. She currently serves on the New York City and State Health Department's buprenorphine advisory committees and was a member of the CDC's Opioid Guideline Workgroup, which issued recommendations for tighter prescription guidelines in March of 2016. Dr. Liu is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine at Montefiore Medical Center and Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Her clinical and education work centers around opioid use disorder treatment, overdose prevention, and HIV prevention and care. Dr. Liu is the medical director of the Montefiore Buprenorphine Treatment Network, where she leads federal, state, and city-funded grants to implement opioid use disorder treatment and overdose prevention education in general medical care. Uh, we're so glad to have you as part of this webinar, uh, Dr. Cunningham and Dr. Liu. Great. Thank you. Uh, we're very happy to be here as well. Um, so I'm going to start off the presentation. Next slide. Um, and we're going to uh, discuss the epidemiology of the opioid epidemic, treatment options for opioid use disorder, and really focusing on some differences by race and ethnicity, uh, buprenorphine treatment in primary care, and focusing on some key barriers particularly around, again, race and ethnicity, and then naloxone for opioid overdose prevention. Next slide. Uh, can you go back to the slide? So 
as many of you know, um, there's been a tremendous increase in opioid prescriptions over the last 20 years. And this is a slide looking at the number of prescriptions um, from 1991 to 2013. And um, we also know that pain became the sixth vital sign in, uh, around 2000, 2001, which also fueled uh, prescribing of opioids. Next slide. But if you fast forward to 2016, um, what you can see here by this top line is that the annual prescribing rate of opioids overall has actually plateaued and, and, and even um, decreased. And a lot of this is really from the national strategies that have occurred, national and state, to really curb opioid prescribing. Next slide. Despite that plateau of opioid prescribing, what we can see in this slide is that opioid overdose deaths have not plateaued. So the green line at the top is opioid overdose deaths from any opioid. And so you can see that that curve is crazy in my mind, um, is not getting uh, better anytime soon, and so we really have a lot of work to do. When you think about the types of opioids that are contributing to this dramatic increase in opioid overdose deaths, you can see the purple line um, is from overdose deaths related to prescribed opioids. And so not surprising, that uh, line has flattened out, which is really consistent with the prescriptions flattening out. However, I think there have been unintended consequences of this um, plateauing of prescribing. And so what we can see is that deaths related to heroin in the orange line or synthetic opioids in that dark blue or black line have dramatically increased. And as many people know, um, fentanyl, which is one of the synthetic opioids, has really uh, fueled the fire in terms of opioid overdose deaths. Next slide. So we can't talk about uh, the opioid epidemic without talking about race and ethnicity. And so this is a slide that looks at deaths um, in uh, white population, non-Hispanic black population, and Hispanic population. And I am a primary care provider. I, I uh, provide addiction treatment um, in the South Bronx. And so I've been doing this for 20 years, and the vast majority of my patients are Hispanic or black. And, and I can tell you that um, there really was very little attention on the opioid epidemic until we saw the shift in the populations. And so while it's really important that we're, we're all focusing attention on addressing the opioid epidemic. It's a bit bittersweet as to, I think, the reasons why now we have a, a sort of more gentle approach and, and clearly we can see those differences um, and how the opioid epidemic has affected different populations. Next slide. So I just want to cover what opioid use disorder is to make sure that we're all on the same page. It's a chronic relapsing and remitting neurobiologic disease in which people lose control and continue to use opioids despite negative consequences. So this is really important. It's a loss of control and continued use despite negative consequences. And so often what, what I hear is the idea that by just taking prescribed opioids that people are sort of um, framed as having an opioid use disorder when that is not necessarily the case. And so um, listed on the slide are the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria. And we now uh, diagnose people into mild, moderate, or severe opioid use disorder. And you can see uh, the number of criteria that people have to fulfill in order to get each one of those categories. And just an important point here is that tolerance and withdrawal symptoms will happen in every single human being who takes opioids for a long enough period of time at a high enough dose. So that if people are prescribed opioids, those two eligibility criteria are removed uh, in terms of the diagnosing opioid use disorder. And so the vast majority of the criteria are looking at loss of control and then also negative consequences um, with continued use. Next slide. So how does opioid use disorder develop? So it's obviously very complex, and um, it's an interplay of genetics, biology, and environment. So there's clearly no one easy answer here on how to uh, address opioid use disorder. 
Um, and there's also no way to predict who will develop an opioid use disorder. So we don't know when people are prescribed opioids, those who are going to have no problems and those who are going to go on and develop problems. What we do know is that the younger the age of initiating any substance, including opioids, the greater the risk of developing a substance use disorder. We also know that there's, there's no cure. And so people need chronic disease management, like many of other chronic diseases that we have. Um, and so this often requires uh, lifelong management that can be either behavioral or um, pharmacologic. So this graph here um, shows how opioid use disorder develops. And so in the green part of the graph is where people have euphoria. The white part of the graph is where people feel normal. And then the red part of the graph is where people experience withdrawal. And so initially, at, uh, over time, when people first start using a substance, they, go, they oscillate between feeling normal and feeling euphoric. However, over time, that really changes, and, and with chronic use, people oscillate between really being in and out of opioid withdrawal. And this is what we see in our patients who have opioid use, use disorder, that by the time they're seeking care, often they just want to feel normal, that by using their opioids, they're not uh, getting euphoric. Next slide. So um, I'm so glad to be joining everybody. My name is Tiffany Liu. I'm also a primary care physician in the Bronx uh, uh, with Dr. Cunningham. So I want to cover the treatment options for opioid use disorder now that we've covered what opioid use disorder is. Next slide. When we talk about the treatment of opioid use disorder, we can think of it in two different categories. And one of that is pharmacologic treatment, the other being non-pharmacologic treatment. We have three medications that are approved by the FDA for the treatment of opioid use disorder. Two of them are opioid agonists, and one of them is an opioid antagonist. So that includes methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. And altogether, for these three medications, we have a robust clinical evidence base about their effectiveness, especially for methadone and buprenorphine, and particularly when the medications are used over a long period of time for maintenance treatment of addiction as a chronic illness. On the other hand, um, even though non-pharmacologic treatment options like detox and rehab um, outpatient and residential treatment programs and self-help programs can have a huge role in addiction treatment. Um, we have very limited to no data regarding their effectiveness. So this is really to caution that when we provide non-pharmacologic treatment without actually coupling it with medications, that we are not operating within a clinical evidence base. Next slide. So based on the many years of research we have uh, around medication treatment effectiveness, we know that especially with methadone and buprenorphine, um, that we see patients uh, being able to engage and be retained in treatment at a much higher rate. And part of this is because the medications are actually treating the neurobiology of uh, the addiction, which is reducing the withdrawal and craving symptoms that patients experience. And those who are receiving medication treatment as part of their opioid use disorder care are 50, up to 50% um, less likely to relapse over time and 75% uh, less likely to die because of their um, addiction. And that's huge because I, uh, especially as a um, internal medicine doctor, I can't really say that about the efficacy of other medications. So truly these are life-saving medication treatments. And not only that, using medications for opioid use disorder treatment saves us money on the societal level. In fact, per patient per month, we can save about uh, $200 in healthcare costs just by offering medication treatment. Every dollar invested actually yields a return of $4 in related criminal justice costs. Next slide. And so this is a table showing um, you the major differences between the three medications for opioid use disorder. So uh, the table shows you that methadone is the oldest approved medication since 1972. Buprenorphine is relatively more recent, approved in 2002. And now Trexone is the newest medication being approved in 2010. Altogether, these medications are available in different formulations. That includes methadone in liquid form, buprenorphine most commonly in sublingual form, and now Trexone is a long-acting injectable medication. 
I want to highlight that sublingual buprenorphine is commonly co-formulated with the opioid antagonist naloxone, and this is done to prevent the misuse of medication um, if someone were to not take it sublingually as uh, directed. So, if, for example, if someone were to inject it for uh, misuse. Buprenorphine actually has many other uh, formulations that are available on the market, not only for the treatment of opioid use disorder, but some in particular are available for the treatment of chronic pain. Next slide. And so this is a figure that highlights the pharmacologic property differences in the three medications that we've been talking about for opioid use disorder. And so um, I want to um, orient everybody to this figure. So on the y-axis, we have um, the level of the medication's effect on our opioid receptors in the brain and in the body. And then on the x-axis is the log dose or the amount of medication that it takes to have that effect in the body. So uh, paying attention to buprenorphine, you'll notice that buprenorphine is um, in the middle th there. It's different than methadone. It's different than naltrexone. And this is actually a graph that highlights what's called the ceiling effect of buprenorphine, meaning that the more you take of buprenorphine, um, you can't actually get more of an opiate effect out of it because that's where the ceiling comes in. This actually, uh, this property of uh, buprenorphine, buprenorphine's pharmacology shapes its safety profile. So in essence, uh, taking more of this medication does not come with a higher risk for opioid overdose. And it actually makes it less desirable for people to divert it for misuse and abuse. Uh, especially compared to methadone. And so knowing that there are differences in pharmacology, this actually affects how we start patients in clinical treatment on the medications. Um, and, uh, and this will flow into the next slide as well. And so because of those pharmacologic differences I showed you, um, the regulations in this country reflect how we can deliver uh, opioid use disorder medication treatment in um, uh, safer ways. So for methadone, historically, because of the fact that the higher the dose you go, the more the overdose risk is associated. Um, therefore, the methadone is uh, del delivered in highly regulated settings. So you must uh, be able to, you must uh, get your methadone at a licensed program, a methadone maintenance treatment program, and only providers at that program can prescribe and dispense medications there. And with that, the counseling, the visits, the urine drug testing, um, dosing, everything is highly regulated. And um, you can imagine that there are different places in this country, um, in, in our states and cities that don't have access to uh, such types of programs. Whereas buprenorphine is very different in that it's minimally regulated compared to methadone. It can be virtually delivered anywhere because any licensed clinical provider who has received, completed the necessary training and received a, spe um, a special DEA license can prescribe it. So this can happen in a primary care doctor's office. This in, can occur in any outpatient or even inpatient setting. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, the patient can actually access the medication at their local pharmacy and sometimes with refills as well. And so, and then naltrexone, as I mentioned, is very new uh, compared to the two, methadone and buprenorphine, and there are actually no regulations around how naltrexone can be delivered. Next slide. So I've introduced you to the availability of highly effective treatment for opioid use disorder, but yet I think this slide is quite saddening because it basically highlights we have a tremendous gap in how we deliver treatment for opioid use disorder in this country. So of the two plus million people uh, with the disease in this country, only less than 20% uh, of them actually receive treatment. And um, again, in my experience as a primary care doctor, I'm appalled because we would never be okay with that if we were talking about diabetes or heart disease. Next slide. So in particular, we, we also need to highlight the stark differences that exist in how racial and ethnic minority populations are or are not able to access evidence-based treatment. So this is a study that was uh, published in a major medical journal, JAMA, from earlier this year. And it shows that over the last decade, uh, where buprenorphine treatment has become available as a, as a community-based treatment option, that Black and other minority populations 
as well as those who have Medicaid and Medicare are far less likely to have benefited from it. Next slide. And so using New York City as an example, so um, this is a map of the, uh, the boroughs of New York City. So, um, I, so this slide, I, I like using it to highlight geographically how buprenorphine treatment is so differentially available according to where you live. So in New York City, uh, looking at 2007 and again, analyzing data in 2016, um, in the paper that's cited here, buprenorphine treatment has historically only been more accessible in high income and non-racial ethnic minority neighborhoods. So I think that uh, we can definitely speculate on why that is, but I want to call this out because we are talking about today, obviously, racial ethnic differences and the fact that um, we people are dying and we're not able to deliver treatment in a way that meets the demand. Next slide. So now we're going to transition to talking about actually delivering buprenorphine treatment in primary care and some of the key barriers um, that exist. Next slide. So we started buprenorphine treatment over a decade ago at Montefiore and Primary Care Clinic in the South Bronx. And we started slow with only three providers. And over the course of the first 10 years, um, treated over 900 patients and trained over 25 prescribers. And so this is feasible to really implement buprenorphine treatment in a, a community clinic. Next slide. We then expanded our buprenorphine treatment from one clinic to um, six primary care clinics. And so this is our model of how we provide treatment. Um, so we have a physician champion in each one of our clinics. We have a treatment coordinator that is either a nurse or a pharmacist. We have a naloxone coordinator as well to integrate naloxone into buprenorphine treatment. Dr. Liu is gonna talk about this a little bit more. And then we also work with a community health worker who provides education and linkage to care for people in the community. And then you can see that um, in addition to this sort of physician champion, there are a number of buprenorphine prescribers at each clinic. Next slide. So in my work of trying to expand buprenorphine treatment with clinics, these are really the top 10 concerns that I've heard over the last decade. So number 10 is I don't want, quote unquote, those patients in the waiting room. Number nine is that a concern about floodgates opening up. And just to sh the previous slide that I had showed actually showed there were no floodgates, that really there was a slow increase in the number of patients over time. Number eight was that we don't want to be social workers. Often uh, medical providers, physicians feel like they don't want to have to provide extensive counseling. Um, number seven is that treatment initiation is too challenging. Number six is that we don't know what to do with polysubstance use. Number five is ordering and interpreting urine drug tests. Number four is concern about diversion. Number three is uh, insurance and prior authorization issues. And then uh, also lack of supportive services and not being trained or not feeling confident in treating addiction. And so I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the three that are highlighted here in red, and particularly because I think race and ethnicity are often tied to these potential barriers. Next slide. So don't want those patients in the waiting room. It's purely all about stigma. Next slide. And what we know is that there's a tremendous amount of stigma with addiction and with the treatment of addiction, and particularly opioid agonist treatment, so methadone and buprenorphine. We know that the stigma is both within patients, so internalized stigma, and then um, around them, so family members, friends, communities, and even healthcare providers, because you know, we all sort of hear the same messages in society. What I argue is, quote unquote, those patients are already in our healthcare system, and so rather than ignoring um, the fact that they uh, struggle with opioid use disorder, um, really tackling that head on uh, can improve both their um, opioid use disorder outcomes and often their other health outcomes as well. And then finally, addiction absolutely does not discriminate, right? So addiction affects old, young, poor, rich, white, black, uh, it, it, it's everywhere. Next slide. 
So some of the ways that we can reduce stigma include just thinking about the language that we use. And so there are websites that um, exist to really talk about uh, changing the language. And we know that changing the language actually matters in terms of the kind of health care that people receive and, and, and the quality of care. So a couple of really basic things um, is the term addict or abuser is really um, stigmatizing and instead using person first language. So we're talking about a person with a substance use disorder rather than an addict. Another thing I hear all the time is the idea of having urines that are clean or dirty. We never talk about other chronic illnesses in this way. And so, again, changing our language to talk about urine drug tests having either positive results or negative results for certain substances is much more appropriate and less stigmatizing. Next slide. Um, ordering and interpreting urine drug screens is another uh, challenge. So we know that there's bias by race and ethnicity. We also know that providers really have a knowledge gap. And one of the things we can do is to standardize testing and interpretation. Next slide. So there are studies that clearly demonstrate that um, there are biases in terms of who gets urine drug tests. And so this was a study that was published in 2018, looking at the percentage of patients who received urine drug tests according to race. And what you can see here is that black patients in the gray bar were much more likely to have urine drug tested ordered than white patients who were in the black bar. Next slide. We also know that, um, not, that, that providers actually lack knowledge around urine drug test interpretation. This is a study we did at Montefiore um, where we asked 100 residents about their level of confidence in interpreting urine drug screens, and about half of them said they were confident. The problem is when we actually then tested their knowledge, those who were confident, 73% uh, of them actually failed uh, a knowledge test. And so this is a problem. Um, you know, at least if you know that you don't know the answer, we go and look it up. But the problem is if we think we know the answer and we actually don't know the answer, then, then, then that is, uh, you know, problematic. Next slide. So one of my colleagues, Dr. Joanna Starles, created this um, guide to help uh, in, interpret urine drug screens. And I know you can't read the, the, what's on this slide, but the point here is that it's complicated. It's much more complicated than people realize. And so um, when in doubt, you know, look up, look some, look up uh, you know, the issue. Um, also, we typically order uh, screening tests, and screening tests are just that. They're screening tests. And so if there are any questions, we should order confirmatory tests, which are the GCMS tests, which are the gas chromatography mass spectrography tests. And then also, to really reduce bias, um, you know, we should standardize our urine drug testing procedures. And so in our clinic, for example, we do urine drug tests on every person and every patient at every visit, and that really takes um, the bias out of the hands of the medical providers. Next slide. Um, diversion is something that definitely people are concerned about, and what I would say is that it happens. Uh, it happens with many meds. It happens less with buprenorphine than other opioids. And again, uh, we need a standardized approach to try and reduce diversion. Next slide. So there were two studies that looked at diversion in the general population and then in the population with opioid use disorder. And so the graph on the left looks at uh, the general population. And what you can see here is that 23% of people reported sharing their medications, and 27% of people reported taking other people's medications. So about a quarter of the population shares their medications, and we see that frequently when people say they took their friend's antibiotics, for example. So that's really no different than patients with opioid use disorder, which is the graph on the right, where you can see similar numbers in terms of who shares medications and take medications. So the point is diversion happens. Uh, it, it, and, and it's really not uh, that different in patients with opioid use disorder than in the general population. Next slide. When compared to other opioids, what we do know is that buprenorphine is diverted much less frequently. And so this was a study looking at 
100 drug treatment programs in the United States and looking at those who were coming into treatment and were asked about which uh, uh, opioids of abuse they were using. And, and the, on the black bar, the black line is um, buprenorphine, and the other lines include uh, oxycodone and hydrocodone. And so you can see that um, people were much less likely to report using buprenorphine um, at, as they enter opioid addiction treatment programs. Next slide. To, to try and minimize aversion, one, one strategy, in addition to the urine drug test that I had talked about, is to um, have treatment agreements. And so these treatment agreements standardize um, care and, and often review um, principles. And so there are many different examples of the kinds of treatment agreements, but often they, you know, uh, they're used as a tool to have discussions with patients about not sharing medications, not using other people's medications, not altering the urine, um, and you know, not getting extra refills, et cetera. Um, and so this is really, I think, a, you know, an important tool to use to really try and address the potential for diversion head on you know, at, at the sort of intake before even starting buprenorphine treatment. Next slide. So I want to um, end our portion of a talk talking about something that uh, hopefully will be much less daunting for an average provider to integrate into their um, efforts to prevent opioid overdose. And that's basically by providing naloxone to patients. And uh, next slide. So what is naloxone? So naloxone is an opioid antagonist. It's a short acting, uh, basically an antidote to opioid overdose. And that's its only function. Um, so basically it doesn't uh, interact with other medications or substances that you take and, it's, and therefore is very safe. It's also not a controlled substance and has no abuse potential. So given that, uh, most states have issued naloxone standing orders, meaning that uh, uh, in theory, Americans can access naloxone, this life-saving medication for opioid overdose um, at any pharmacy without a prescription. Some states, including New York, also offer copay assistance to make it uh, free to low cost uh, for people to access medication. And there's also Good Samaritan laws uh, that basically encourage bystanders to take action and administer naloxone to someone who may be overdose, uh, overdosing and not worry so much about being arrested. And uh, the evidence that, the best evidence we have, and this actually comes out of um, the New York City Department of Health, is that of all the naloxone uh, medications that we're able to provide to non-medical personnel, one out of four kits or 25% of the lay people who are trained were able to use a kit to save a life and reverse opioid overdose within one year of getting trained. And this is just a nice poster to show you um, some of the public awareness campaigns that we are very familiar with in New York. Uh, state and city, and I hope that this um, similar efforts are also going on in your states as well. Next slide. So how are we integrating this safe and life-saving uh, life medication into our practice here at Montefiore Einstein? So we have a formal opioid overdose prevention program that operates alongside the buprenorphine treatment program that Dr. Cunningham introduced. So what that is, is we provide education about how to use naloxone, when to use it, and we actually give people a take-home kit. So on the lower left-hand corner, you'll see a picture of what this kit is. We work with the City Department of Health to obtain these medications for free. And we've, been, we've rolled out this distribution program in 12 hospital units at our major academic teaching hospital. That's also one of the busiest hospitals in New York City. Uh, we also do this program in seven of our community clinics, and that covers all of our sites that provide buprenorphine treatment and primary care. We, on a weekly basis, uh, participate in community health fairs around New York City. We also conduct our own outreach events. We have weekly office hours, so anybody can uh, arrange for their own training if they wish. And finally, we have a centralized email access, making it easier uh, to disseminate uh, information about where to find us. And, um, and that's just a simple email called naloxone at montefiore.org. And this is how we get requests throughout the entire New York City um, uh, for us to offer people education and training on naloxone. Next slide. 
So in summary, we've covered a lot, but uh, we have basically introduced you to the idea that there is an evolving epidemic of prescription um, opioid use, now, now really um, about illicit opioid use, and that racial and thick minorities are the most heavily affected. Um, medication treatment of opioid use disorder is very effective, but woefully underutilized, and that racial ethnic minorities are much less likely to access buprenorphine treatment, even though it's one of the most flexible community-based treatments we can offer. And so barriers to buprenorphine treatment should be re uh, addressed, and we reviewed um, the main topics of reducing stigma, uh, standardizing the way that we administer urine drug testing and uh, interpret them, and contextualizing the fact that diversion does exist, and we should really just adopt a patient-centered approach um, to this issue. And finally, um, as we are trying to um, offer uh, treatment throughout our communities, first and foremost, we really do need to make sure people are staying alive to receive treatment, and that is we can offer naloxone for opioid overdose prevention in all of our communities. And that's it. Thank you. Next slide. So just want to thank uh, many collaborators in our Division of General Internal Medicine at Montefiore Einstein, the many patients we have um, had the privilege to take care of, our funders um, from federal to state levels, and um, Dr. Chinazo Cunningham and I are both very active on Twitter if um, uh, anyone wants to engage in a dialogue with us. <clears throat> and you can find our Twitter handles listed here on the webinar slide. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Cunningham and Dr. Liu, for that very substantive presentation and covering so much ground for us. Our next speakers, Dr. Edwin Chapman and Ms. Wanda Brown, will share further context on the opioid epidemic in racial and ethnic minority populations and discuss an integrated care model which leverages telehealth and community partnerships to support better treatment quality and outcomes. Dr. Chapman is a nationally recognized leader in efforts to integrate substance use disorder treatment and psychiatry seamlessly into general medical practice. He's practiced in Washington, D.C. for over 40 years, specializing in internal medicine and addiction medicine. In January of 2019, he was appointed to the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Committee Examination of the Integration of Opioid and Infectious Disease Prevention Efforts and Select Programs, and he currently collaborates with the Howard University School of Pharmacy and College of Medicine as an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Behavioral Health and Psychiatry. And Ms. Brown is a certified social worker who serves as an outreach specialist and recovery coach at Prestige Telehealth Solutions. Prestige improves the health outcomes of patients across the continuum through innovative access to care like telehealth. So welcome, uh, Dr. Chapman and Ms. Brown. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you. Uh, so I'm going to give uh, uh, an overview and uh, once I give that overview, uh, Mrs. Brown will be available to uh, cover any questions that uh, you might have. Uh, uh, so uh, let's move on to the first slide. So my practice uh, uh, has been over 13 years using buprenorphine in an office-based practice after running a methadone clinic for 12 years. And uh, what I'm going to uh, illustrate are uh, some of the differences in a uh, uh, an institutional-based uh, practice versus a private practice uh, in uh, creating the services needed. Uh, so I've treated uh, a thousand patients uh, over the past 13 years. Currently, have a patient load of uh, 275 patients. Uh, I'm a single practitioner uh, with uh, a small office staff of uh, two people, uh, two persons. Uh, uh, in addition to uh, laboratory services. So uh, what I would like to do is first give you uh, a, uh, a culturally uh, sensitive approach to uh, the opioid addiction in the African-American community. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, talk about some of our uh, history uh, in treatment, uh, which may help to overcome stigma. Uh, then uh, third, uh, the necessity of rebuilding the village uh, because so much of our history has been uh, through uh, treatment through incarceration. Uh, fourth, building a technical in, uh, infrastructure uh, to accomplish that. And the, the last uh, uh, 
uh, which Ms. Brown will uh, elaborate on, is how do we connect to the larger community? Next slide. Next slide. So our history uh, has been very tra traumatic, uh, and uh, understanding this will uh, play an important role in understanding addiction in the African American community. There's been no decade uh, over the past 400 years uh, in which African Americans have not been abused uh, all the way through to today. Next slide. So that abuse uh, is uh, really uh, suppressed uh, uh, and uh, through cognitive dissonance or selective amnesia, uh, these are protective me uh, mechanisms that individuals and the community has used. Even though uh, we see pe people uh, on a daily basis standing on the corner, uh, the fact uh, is that they have a history and that history uh, is a history of toxic stress uh, generated from slavery, through lynching, through Jim Crow, through mass incarceration for addiction. Next slide. So this is an article, a journal article from uh, Yale uh, Law School that really talks about that uh, history uh, through the criminal justice system. Next slide. And even here in Washington, uh, if you're African American uh, 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 male uh, in particular, you're 10 times more often uh, to be incarcerated as whites. Next, uh, next slide. And then uh, the, we're invisible even by the media. So we've had uh, an opioid epidemic uh, in the African American com community for over 50 years but uh, it was never discussed. Next slide. And uh, as Drs. Cunningham and Lou have pointed out, treatment, uh, there's a marked disparity in treatment, uh, and I won't go into uh, further details on that, but the access to buprenorphine is quite complicated uh, uh, and really is in part due to the fact that uh, we're only 5% of the physician population in, in the country and less than 2% of the mental health providers. Next slide. So when we look at the buprenorphine uh, divide, uh, only 2.7% of uh, buprenorphine prescriptions are provided uh, to uh, uh, African-American patients. Next slide. Once in the criminal justice system, uh, even when one comes out, uh, you're fre uh, frequently unemployable, uh, which has a, a tremendous inter intergenerational impact on our community, uh, leading not only to uh, return to uh, drugs uh, or quote unquote criminal activity, but it also separates families and we have multiple multiple generations of families in which uh, men and women have been displaced from the community, uh, uh, having a lasting impact, uh, especially on criminal behavior. So we now have uh, uh, children being raised by grandparents uh, because the parents are either dead or uh, incarcerated due to uh, 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 the use of drugs. Next slide. So when we look at this in its totality, uh, we have a system uh, that has really built uh, uh, the outcomes that we're seeing uh, in the African-American community. Next slide. So when we look at the totality of that, uh, we've talked a lot about stigma uh, in the uh, medical community, uh, the family uh, uh, separation and ostracism. Uh, we have significant insurance barriers, including uh, prior authorizations, but also dosing uh, limits uh, based on uh, perceived uh, diversion. Uh, and, and we really, uh, instead of now 
talking about an opioid epidemic, we have a fentanyl epidemic. So 90% of the patients that come into our office have been exposed to fentanyl, which is 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin. So it would stand to reason that uh, dosing adjustments for buprenorphine uh, and methadone might be in order. Uh, we've also talked about the criminal justice system uh, and the avarice to uh, incarcerate, uh, the media bias, and of course, uh, uh, inept uh, government uh, 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 public policy. And, and that is an issue that uh, is ongoing in terms of uh, recognition of the problem. So that's our cycle of darkness. Next slide. So knowing our history and the fact that we have had uh, ancestors and elders uh, who have contributed significantly to treatment of opioids uh, for the past 50 or 60 years. Next slide. And this was discussed uh, at the recent uh, National Medical Association uh, convention uh, uh, by uh, the Satcher Group uh, out of Morehouse, uh, really showing the impact of stress, uh, intergenerational stress, even uh, in utero. And now there's studies that uh, suggest that even uh, fathers uh, uh, through stress and uh, drug use and uh, other activities may have an impact on uh, the developing uh, embryo. Next slide. So the American Academy of Pediatrics has uh, indicated that uh, uh, racism uh, does have an impact on drinking, smoking, and uh, drug experimentation. Next slide. And again, this is uh, well documented that black people are more likely to initiate opioid use uh, through heroin uh, and uh, or street drugs, uh, including cocaine, uh, uh, because of uh, this uh, history of racism. So 95% of our patients uh, uh, initiate their drug usage uh, through street drugs, not through uh, drugs from the doctor's office, although they may ultimately uh, use uh, prescription drugs at some point. Next slide. And this simply shows uh, from a historical standpoint, uh, the uh, 50 year, 50 to 60 year uh, history of uh, drug abuse uh, in the African American community being uh, treated as a moral problem. And this has been uh, 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 ingrained also in African American uh, culture. Next slide. So one of the things that uh, we found uh, uh, in our uh, initial studies at Howard University, that 42% of our patients uh, lack access to mental health uh, services. We now know that 50, uh, about 50% 50 of our patients suffer from ang minimum anxiety and depression, uh, but 90% of our patients have some diagnosable mental health uh, problem. Next slide. So knowing uh, this uh, history of emotional pain and uh, the confusion that uh, it uh, permeates throughout the community uh, is really the underlying cause of the stigma. Next slide. But when we look at our history, uh, we find that uh, a, a little known physician, Dr. Melissa Freeman, was one of the pioneers along with Vincent Doe and Marie Neiswander uh, in methadone treatment. And she was actually the first person to successfully treat a pregnant woman uh, through uh, to term uh, in uh, the 1960s. Next slide. Next slide. So Dr. Uh, Freeman is now 93 years old. She still practices medicine uh, in New York and she still runs a methadone clinic. So uh, if, if that uh, uh, does not tell us something about compassion and the need to remove uh, stigma uh, from our medical community, uh, then I don't know what else will. Next slide. 
So this is Dr. Benny Prim, who was a pioneer uh, in integrating uh, methadone treatment and primary care, realizing that many of his patients were also concurrently uh, infected uh, with HIV and hepatitis C. So uh, about 30 years ago, uh, he created the first integrated uh, treatment program uh, for uh, using methadone uh, and primary care, uh, treating the whole patient. Next slide. And this is uh, Ron Clark, who had an abstinence treatment program here in Washington for over 50, uh, 40 years. Uh, uh, again, uh, recognizing that uh, our patient clientele, uh, not knowing their history and uh, feeling uh, uh, really uh, 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 self-deprecated, uh, uh, needed to know more about who they are and why they were in uh, the circumstances that, uh, that they experienced. So through that, he, he developed an Afrocentric uh, therapeutic uh, community that was extremely successful. Next slide. So treatment should not be a question of uh, medication versus abstinence, but both in proper proportions. Next, next slide. And we know that our brains can recover. Next slide. So these are our five C's of, of treatment. Compassion, consistency, competence, and we now uh, uh, need a collaborative uh, uh, coordination of care, especially for an office-based practice uh, uh, to really deal with the social determinants of health. And of course, uh, a model uh, that uh, compensates all. Next slide. So how do we rebuild the village uh, from a positive base of spirituality and a history of resilience? Next slide. So we know that the uh, faith community, uh, again indicated in the uh, Journal of Law, is extremely important in reaching uh, our community, but has been uh, drastically underutilized. Next slide. And again, this shows the impact of the faith community. This was uh, one of the churches in Washington, D.C. that uh, we worked with recently in getting that message out. And the founding pastor, you can see, is holding the Bible, but uh, the uh, rest of the constituents were uh, Civil War fighters. So we can't fight uh, uh, literally now, but we can fight uh, figuratively through the churches. Next slide. So the District of Columbia uh, just last month uh, initiated a new pilot program um, uh, using uh, the churches as uh, a uh, and faith community as a place to uh, begin educating the community. And there were four objectives. Uh, the first was ho hosting conversations on opioid awareness and understanding the signs and symptoms of opioid uh, use disorder, promoting a day of recovery, uh, discussion of treatment and recovery services, and training the community members on naloxone. Next slide. But we also have to build a technical in, uh, infrastructure in order to be able to objectively measure outcomes uh, in the medical community. Next slide. And, and that was our task uh, uh, some six or seven years ago uh, when we organized the Urban Health Initiative at Howard uh, to really address uh, the, opi the impact of drugs, uh, particularly opioids, uh, uh, on African-American patients and their entire family, recognizing all of the above. Next slide. So uh, during that period, uh, I uh, transitioned my office from paper records to electronic medical records. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. 
but we also implemented uh, telemedicine uh, because, uh, as mentioned earlier, I'm not a psychiatrist, although uh, I'm adjunct in the Department of Behavioral Health, but the idea was how to integrate uh, substance abuse, primary care, and uh, behavioral health uh, in uh, a remote office setting. Next slide. So the design uh, was rather simple. Uh, using telemedicine, uh, we would be able to share services with the hospital, uh, social workers, uh, psychiatrists, uh, depending on what the uh, particular office site, uh, remote office site had to offer. Uh, and by uh, interchanging uh, that information, uh, uh, whether on the same uh, electronic medical uh, system or different electronic medical systems, uh, we could uh, collaborate uh, for the service of the patient. Next slide. So we built uh, my practice uh, uh, around the buprenorphine treatment, uh, the fact that uh, we uh, had a large number of uh, patients that we were treating, uh, we put toxicology uh, screening or access uh, in the office uh, and uh, uh, brought in uh, uh, primary care providers uh, to augment that practice. Next slide. And connected that through uh, teleconsultation uh, with uh, uh, the university. Next slide. So uh, one of the major areas that of concern, again, uh, 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 would be mental health uh, services, which are in short supply in our community. So using telemedicine, uh, it would be possible to connect with psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, and peer navigators. Next slide. And particularly, uh, we're concerned, uh, just as Ron Clark, about culturally sensitive programs and the fact that because of our history of treatment through incarceration, we have added problem in reintegrating uh, patients and reconstructing families. So our approach was uh, build, rebuilding the village uh, ecosystem. And these are master uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, and uh, community social workers. Next slide. We're also uh, well aware of uh, the fact that we have uh, uh, infectious diseases, so uh, we can also uh, augment our consultations for treatment uh, like uh, uh, hepatitis C uh, through telemedicine. And uh, as a matter of fact, in Rochester, uh, uh, Rochester University has a connection with about 10 or 12 sites across uh, New York State and remote areas uh, in treating uh, hepatitis C. Next slide. So we have to build uh, that the connection with the community in order to reduce the strain on the private practitioner's uh, office uh, as, as earlier stated. Next slide. And we are well aware of the many problems uh, in our communities, uh, housing, uh, employment, uh, uh, financial uh, counseling, uh, criminal justice, child care, all created by uh, substance abuse. Next slide. So we know that uh, only 20% of health outcomes are predicated on uh, things that happen in the doctor's office in the hospital. So this connection or the uh, social determinants of health is critical. Next slide. Uh, so this is just a, a, a schematic diagram that really shows the complexity of this whole process uh, uh, and the idea that it does take a village. Next slide. So building on that and the fact that uh, we uh, have a scarcity of providers, uh, we have providers who are uncomfortable treating this population, uh, that a mentoring system has to be created. 
So Howard University is now uh, uh, moving towards uh, Project ECHO uh, uh, using uh, telementoring. Next slide. And these are the uh, basic uh, principles of uh, Project ECHO, which came out of uh, uh, the University of New Mexico, um, uh, so that we can uh, amplify the use of technology, that we can uh, uh, help mentor uh, practices and best practices, uh, case-based learning, uh, as well as uh, uh, creating a web-based database. Next slide. Uh, so this is uh, 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 one of the uh, uh, young providers who uh, uh, I've mentored uh, uh, in my office. Next slide. Uh, this is a program that was put on the by the uh, auxiliary of the National Medical Association at Howard University. Again, uh, creating an atmosphere of education uh, at the uh, college level. Next slide. And finally, we're well aware of the displacement of this population. So 16 uh, to 50 percent of our patients are homeless. 16 percent are homeless on the street or in a shelter. Uh, the complement uh, are couch surfing with family members uh, um, uh, or friends, uh, which creates a uh, a very uh, dangerous dy uh, dynamic uh, in that these patients are exposed to uh, uh, life-threatening situations on a daily basis. Next slide. So again, organizations uh, like the Urban League uh, become critical, uh, and the Urban League uh, in Chicago put out a, a seminal study uh, really uh, illustrating the uh, uh, problems in the African American community and the fact that uh, we had been overlooked uh, by the media. So this was uh, through the Chicago Urban League. Next slide. So we realized that uh, opioid, uh, the opioid epidemic is, uh, affects everybody. Uh, so that we have taken our message to uh, anybody and everybody uh, uh, in the region and also uh, nationally because uh, any community or any person that's left untreated uh, becomes a potential vector uh, for infectious diseases, for criminal activity, uh, or for continued drug use. Next slide. Uh, so this simply uh, shows an algorithm uh, again, uh, the green arrow in the middle showed that, uh, again, that, that medication-assisted treatment on the right-hand side uh, is preferred to abstinence only uh, 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 and reduces the uh, overdose deaths. But we also have to augment uh, treatment uh, in siloed uh, 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 practices, uh, either in methadone clinics uh, where uh, only substance abuse is being treated because, again, because of the social economics of this population, uh, they are, are uh, very unlikely to travel uh, for multiple appointments in, in different places. So those practices uh, have to be uh, integrated. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So when we look back at that uh, group of gentlemen on the corner, uh, many people uh, see zero value. Next slide. But we value each one of them at about $105,000. And if you add that together, uh, it's about $750,000. Next slide. Next slide. And we can reduce that 105,000, even if they're only uh, partially abstinent uh, through harm reduction to 50,000. And if patients are completely abs abstinent, uh, we can reduce that overall cost to 20,000. 
Next slide. So we need universal health coverage, universal uh, addiction uh, treatment in order to uh, eliminate related infectious diseases. And the National Academy of Science is looking at the opioid uh, epidemic uh, as if it was uh, an infectious disease uh, epidemic of tuberculosis. Uh, so these are all the necessary steps uh, in order to treat. Next slide. And in summary, uh, we, we have to overcome the myths and stigma. We have to incentivize providers to treat uh, in our community. Uh, and we're looking uh, at a Ryan White-like uh, financial structure, uh, remove provider patient caps. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, we have uh, far more availability of street drugs than we have providers uh, uh, medical providers to treat. So this is a public policy uh, issue. Uh, we also need to provide uh, augment uh, provider services through uh, universal uh, university curricula uh, to, develop, to develop that treatment uh, pipeline. And we have to create a payment structure uh, that uh, also incorporates uh, the payment uh, uh, contributions of the faith community, uh, non-government organizations, and peer support workers. We need to rapidly expand housing uh, and tailored uh, employment or re-employment. Uh, and we also need to look at modifying or ending 42 CFR, which uh, separates uh, uh, medical records from uh, mental health rec records. Next slide. And I can be contacted uh, uh, at this website and telephone number. And thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Chapman, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us in this webinar. Um, and a thank you to all of our presenters for taking the time to share your expertise with us today. I hope that all of our participants have uh, been enlightened by these presentations and find the information useful in all of the work that you do. So now that we've wrapped up our presentations, I uh, want to move into our Q&A session, and I want to invite people to continue to submit questions via the chat box, and thanks to folks who have already sent in questions. We'll try to get through as many of them as we can. But the first question I, I actually want to direct to um, Ms. Wanda Brown, who um, is a recovery coach, and I'd like to ask you, Ms. Brown, to tell us a bit about your role as a recovery coach and what the impact has been in um, supporting individuals in recovery. Uh, yes, uh, my role is to connect clients from Dr. Chapman's office or in the community to mental health services uh, with our core service agency. And uh, we do that by, um, well, helping to create a foundation for them to stay in recovery. Um, we do, I do that by connecting them to DBH first and then doing their intake process, get, getting them a diagnostic assessment and then connecting them to a CSW within our organization, as well as therapy and psychiatric treatment. Great, thanks very much and have you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, it was, go ahead. Hey, um, just wanted to ask you how you've seen your role in connecting people to services and helping uh, folks be more successful in recovery um, and what barriers you've seen along the way? Well, I treat them with compassion upon first meeting them and, you know, throughout the time that I stay connected with them and, you know, handing them over to um, our agency, um, I, I treat them with the humanistic approach, you know, that they're before the grace. Anybody could be in that situation. <clears throat> so I treat them with respect and they, um, they latch on to that and they move forward thinking that they can be successful. Great. Thanks very much for that insight into, into your role and how you support individuals. So let me um, go to the questions that we've received so far in our chat box. Um, we have a number of questions around differential access to the medications um, utilized in medication-assisted treatment. So just want to ask, I think all of our panelists have touched on this. Um, 
what are some more of the factors that contribute to uh, differential access? Is there um, is knowledge and perception among communities of color a contributing factor? Um, you know, what explains some of these differences between areas that have methadone and areas that have uh, buprenorphine? Um, this is Chinazo Cunningham. I can I can start. I think so. There's definitely a long history here, um, and and I think that Dr. Chapman was alluding to this is that you know methadone has been around for um, 50 years, and traditionally the methadone programs have been in communities of color specifically, and as the opioid epidemic has evolved. We saw slides about how it's really reached different communities, so out of the inner cities, more in suburbia or in rural areas and among white um, populations. And so those methadone programs have not historically been in those communities. And we, and so what we've been doing um, with the opioid epidemic is really trying to expand treatment with buprenorphine, right? Because methadone is so highly regulated that it's nearly impossible to expand methadone programs. And so, and so it's sort of, you know, by default, because of where the methadone programs have been located, then we see the sort of outgrowth of buprenorphine in other locations. I would say that's one reason. There's another reason, too, is, you know, so I'm in a federally qualified community health center. I serve nearly all publicly insured patients. And I was really worried that our patients would not have access to buprenorphine because what we see in medicine repeatedly is that as new treatments and technologies occur, uh, they're not equally distributed in our society. And this is just, so methadone and buprenorphine is just, buprenorphine is just one example of this. Um, and so what, what, what we know is that there are private doctors who are, you know, cash-only businesses who are, uh, you know, not even interested in taking private insurance to, to, to keep treatment off the record. And then there's only a certain segment of the population that can do that. And so, for example, in New York City, in, you know, in Manhattan, there are private practices that are really cash only that just do buprenorphine and reach a certain segment of the population. And so, so I think that those things definitely contribute um, to the, the disparities. It's really the, the way our healthcare system has been set up. So, uh, in that regard, uh, on the private practice side, uh, I uh, take 99% of my patients are Medicaid, uh, Medicaid or Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, but again, uh, that uh, has made my practice a target of uh, uh, the Medicaid uh, 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 in DC, uh, both from the fee for service Medicaid and uh, the uh, MCO Medicaid, uh, because you will uh, get investigated. And uh, I went through a year of investigations, uh, again, uh, because uh, it was perceived that I was treating, quote, unquote, too many patients. Uh, when, in fact, I had the credentials, uh, I was doing research and uh, also uh, had the uh, model that uh, people were looking at to expand those services. So there have been doctors who have been uh, shut down across the country by the DEA. So I think part of the story that has not been told, we've heard a lot about the supply side uh, and the uh, machinations of the, uh, the uh, pharmaceutical companies, the distributors, and, uh, and doctors in writing prescriptions for pills, but we really haven't uh, really seen the full story on the treatment side and how uh, uh, providers are handcuffed uh, uh, and targeted by uh, uh, the uh, government regulators, uh, the DEA, and the insurance companies, because these are expensive patients and they really don't want to treat them. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham, and thank you, Dr. Chapman, for your answers to that. Um, there are also a number of questions around subpopulations and vulnerable subpopulations, like the uh, individuals who are homeless, 
um, just as involved individuals, and then some questions around young people. So I want to ask you about um, particular considerations for addressing the barriers that might be faced um, by these subpopulations, um, and, and also what role providers might play in educating other partners in this space. So for instance, legislators, law enforcement, um, uh, and others, uh, maybe even other providers who may have misperceptions about medication-assisted treatment and opioid use disorder. Um, this is Tiffany Liu. I'm happy to take a, a stab at that question, specifically about how to um, address a subpopulation. Um, I can speak to uh, folks who are homeless, um, as well as those who are just marginally housed. So I think one of the lessons we've learned um, in our work in the Bronx is to really uh, partner with community-based organizations that operate outside of just the traditional walls of the medical center. So in New York City, for example, there are plenty of organizations that work around housing as well as offer safe um, sort of drop in places for people who use drugs to have a safer place to um, uh, to stay. And so we certainly in advertising our services and recruiting patients, we work directly with the community based organizations. We have memorandums of understanding that there's a mutual uh, bi directional referral um, stream that we we work along. Um, I also want to highlight that, um, uh, so we are very fortunate that we have several very robust syringe exchange programs in New York City. Um, so one of our colleagues in our Division of General Internal Medicine, Dr. Brianna Norton, was actually instrumental in creating um, a, a medical clinic that runs out, out of the, the same syringe exchange program site. So this means that people who may have way more severe addiction, who might be marginally housed, can not only go in to get their um, clean works, but they're able to access medication treatment um, on site instead of having to schlep all the way to um, a medical center where they might feel more stigmatized or um, you know, uh, uh, less welcome. So I think uh, the message is to really, as a medical provider, think about who exists in your community and not uh, think of it as sort of like, we can't help these patients who have complex psychosocial issues because it's, we're not, we don't necessarily have to be the ones to do all those case management or social services. We just have to know who to uh, work with um, in terms of connecting the patients. Um, this is Chinaza Cunningham. Totally agree with Dr. Liu. And then I would just add, for at least the incarcerated uh, individuals or those who are um, justice involved, um, really pushing our system to provide life-saving medications in jails and prisons. I mean, there just is no other way um, uh, because we know that this group is really at of the highest risk of overdose upon release of jail or prison, and so starting treatment in jails or prisons, and then helping transition, and again, working with our community-based organizations that provide social services for people that are just criminal justice involved is critical. There's one other population that we also need to look at, and those are patients who have been on uh, opioid-based uh, pain medications for a number of years, and are then suddenly uh, uh, no longer provided access because of uh, the fear that uh, the physician is going to be investigated by the DEA. So those patients need to be transitioned uh, to treatment uh, uh, in a more humane way uh, because they are at risk to uh, then seek uh, uh, transition to street drugs and uh, and that, uh, that's when they overdose uh, and die. That's great. Thank you very much to you all. Um, we have a few questions around how to strengthen the capacity of community health workers or navigators or peer support specialists um, to engage and uh, support uh, individuals through treatment. How does that work and what resources are there available to um, help build the capacity of, of these individuals as part of the uh, service delivery system? Um, well, basically, from my perspective, I connect them to day programs um, and other resources that will help to uh, 
keep them out of the areas where they uh, find themselves using. Um, CSWs like myself, we encourage them to stay engaged with their doctor, you know, their um, doctor that helps them with their uh, opioid addiction and just, um, just continue to support them uh, by giving them options other than what they've been used to experiencing. And this is Tiffany Liu. I, I'd love to chime in because um, uh, at Montefiore, we've had experience working with integrating community health workers in our treatment program, as well as our overdose prevention program. Um, so we're certainly learning um, in this process. And um, the way we've been able to integrate community health workers is uh, in two ways. So specifically, they conduct overdose prevention um, trainings in our clinics, so in the waiting room, so that patients and their family members and friends while they're waiting for their provider, they're not necessarily relying on the provider to identify their, you know, circumstances that may, may be such that they're at risk for witnessing an overdose. So our community health workers are out there um, lowering the threshold for getting the word out there on naloxone and over overdose prevention. They actually distribute kits directly to anybody who comes up for training. Um, they also do events in the community, so they go to farmers markets, education, um, health education fairs. Uh, they link up with, um, for example, different security um, uh, security agencies that actually work with our medical center, so that security guards um, are armed with naloxone as a way to save a life when they find someone who's you know, collapsed in the bathroom floor, for example. Um, they have trained uh, local, uh, they, they're currently working with um, uh, uh, the local, um, uh, talking to the local DA's office about training their off, um, their staff actually. So I think the community health workers in terms of um, publicizing addiction as something that is multifaceted and that everyone can do something about it. They're sort of the lowest um, threshold of engagement with community and using the lockstone as the entryway to talk about this topic. The second thing that we've learned is um, we have been able to get community health workers situated in our clinics um, so that uh, as the patients are coming in for a medical management visit with their provider, whether or not that's a physician, a nurse, or a clinical pharmacist, they're also getting a um, social assessment with our community health worker. So that means the community health worker is able to identify whether or not the patient has needs with um, housing, uh, housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, even in the case of a, a patient I just saw with a community health worker earlier this week, the patient had all his clothes stolen from a homeless shelter, so he was in need of, um, of clothes. So our community health worker was able to talk to this patient about accessing local, uh, local sources for um, you know, low cost or free clothing drives. So I think those are the different ways we've seen um, it pan out at Montefiore, and I certainly think that um, there's more room to in integrate community health workers, but I think those are the two big areas of concrete services for patients and naloxone education for the community. Okay, thank you, Ms. Brown and Dr. Liu. And I know we're reaching um, the end of our time, but just wanna squeeze in one final question so we've received so many great questions. And the last question is, about engagement. So are there best practices related to identifying individuals who are ready and willing to receive medication assisted treatment? And how does that screening and engagement and enlistment into treatment work? So uh, the philosophy that we use is that there's no wrong door. And uh, when we look at the various uh, uh, contact uh, uh, potential out there, including uh, needle exchange uh, is a classic example. Patients may not be ready uh, at that point to stop using, but needle exchange could be the trust, build the trust factor that eventually gets them into treatment. Uh, I recently read an article that Philadelphia is going to uh, open uh, the first safe site, safe injection site, uh, which has been uh, used uh, in Vancouver and Europe uh, for a number of years and actually reduces overdoses and deaths. But again, uh, it's a trusting atmosphere that patients will uh, subsequently begin uh, that first step uh, 
uh, and the uh, potential encouragement to to go into uh, 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 medication assisted treatment. We are uh, uh, facing uh, not an opioid epidemic, but a fentanyl epidemic uh, that is rapidly sweeping across the country. And uh, uh, in many instances, there is no second chance. So, so uh, any contact with the medical system should be utilized as an opportunity to place that patient in treatment, whether it's in the jail or whether it's an overdose uh, and a visit to the emergency room, that patient uh, should be started on treatment uh, at that point. Okay. Thanks so much, Dr. Chapman. And thanks again to all of our presenters and also to everyone who participated in this webinar today and for the great discussion. So thanks to everyone who submitted questions. Um, I think what we'll do is we will take all of the questions and try to follow up via email as much as we can because um, we uh, don't want your questions to go unanswered. Um, so just want to remind folks of a few things before we close out. If you'll please take a few minutes to complete our evaluation survey, which should pop up on the screen once you exit, um, that would be uh, really helpful for us to get your feedback. Um, and also, you should be receiving the survey, as well as a link for the recording of the webinar and instructions for receiving a CHES or CMEs um, via a follow-up email within 24 hours. And I also just want to remind folks that you can download uh, from the handout drop-down box uh, in the webinar platform now, or you can request um, via email at info at minorityhealth.hhs.gov. And also want to uh, invite you to keep an eye out and to participate in our final webinar in the webinar series, which will focus on cultural and linguistic competency. So thank you so much again, everyone, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.